So let me introduce first off John Denham, who's Member of Parliament for Southampton Etchin and the former Secretary of State for the Department of Innovation, Universities and Southampton. <laughs> We have spoken of real people alongside the politicians. They hate it when I say that. But Julie Greer, who's head teacher at Sherbrooke Primary School in Eastleigh. Julie. <laughs> so on the right off our panel here, and slightly to the right of politics, we have George Hollingbury, who's a new MP, Conservative MP, the Member of Parliament for Meon Valley. Right Honourable Chris Hume, Liberal Democrat, Member of Parliament for Eastleigh, the man with most power in the room, the Secretary of State. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Laurie McHenry needs no introduction. Lastly, but not least, Caroline Sennett, who's the former director of the Business Southampton and the first female president of Southampton and Fairham Chamber of Commerce, a partner at a law firm. Caroline Sennett. <laughs> and you over to Lindsay Noble, who's the principal of Southampton City College. Lindsay. Um, I've, I've got a very, very short uh, few words to say to you. First of all, a very big welcome to the Hub Theatre at the Hub at Southampton City College. This is a new venue, as I'm sure you're aware. Um, we opened it um, back in uh, last September. And one of the things I want to say to you is that we have a brochure about it. The Hub and the Hub Theatre has been designed for community events. And the benefit of you using it as a community event or for a community event is that you're helping us train the new generation of students in a whole range of different skills. Food and hospitality, um, media, theatre technology, uh, supporting um, uh, the, the, the curriculum in all sorts of different ways. We want to do exhibitions and other events in there and all our business studies students and technology students can all help with that. So, for us, it's about giving our students a real experience of the work that they can do, working to a client brief, and that's so important for their future careers. Um, secondly, I just want to say City College is 60 this year, and we'll be celebrating in the summer, so it's our Diamond Jubilee, Jubilee as well. And for 60 years, we've been serving the community of Southampton. I suppose the provocative statement I want to make before I make that provocative statement, I just want to say how well we're doing. Um, our success rates are in the top five colleges in the country for all more, technical term, but in the top five colleges in the whole country for, for our success rates. And we, as you can see from here, um, we're, we're delighted to have our students studying one of, one of the top colleges in the area for success rates. So we're 60 years old, and we've done that by serving the local community. We haven't listened too much to what the government have asked us to do. We've done it by making sure that we meet the needs of our local community and do the right thing for them. And we concentrate on doing that, and we try and make the funding work for them. And I think that's, that's all I want to say, but that's part of the starting point, I think, for this event tonight. And you're very, very welcome, and thank you very much for coming. So let's dive in first with our question from Cathy Pope, who's Professor of Medical Sociology at the University of Southampton. Thank you. The drastic cuts to local authority budgets will hit deprived areas hardest and make health inequalities even greater. What do the panellists think local and national politicians should do to reduce the health gap between the richest people and the poorest people? And let's start with Chris Hewn. Well, one of the key things to remember on the health budget is that we are actually, as a government, are preserving uh, the health budget in, in, in real terms. So that this is the one part of government spending that has 
with, with, well, there are two parts of government spending that have not had very substantial cuts. One is the National Health Service budget, and the other is the uh, budget for overseas development, uh, which is actually increasing to meet our 0.7% target. So the first point to make is that the National Health Service has been protected against cuts in a way that no other part of the uh, domestic government budget has been. Uh, the second point is we need to do more, particularly on public health, because a lot of the issues around um, particularly uh, health in deprived areas revolved around things like uh, um, behavior and nutrition, particularly diet, smoking, uh, alcohol, I mean a lot of those issues are ones that we need to focus more attention on precisely because they have very bad health outcomes uh, and we continue thirdly to try and make sure that the allocation of funding within the NHS just as for example the allocation of funding on the education budget is focused most on those in need uh, and less on those who might be if you like glamour Glamour medicine. Uh, but uh, just to point out, for example, on the um, education budget, one of the things I'm very proud that the government has done uh, is to have introduced the pupil premium to help those from deprived backgrounds in education by providing an uplift for uh, some of the schools with the most deprived catchment areas. So, my constituency, Sherbrooke School, for example, is getting an extra £50,000 this year because of the pupil premium. And it's through these spend indirect that ways that what was we that, can Julie? actually... You spend that very wisely. And very wisely. <laughs> uh, you know, in these indirect ways, we can actually help uh, deal with some of these uh, real problems uh, where, where families are most deprived. J Julie Greer, a reference made to your school already. <laughs> so how do you see this? It is a time of cuts. Are the Liberal Democrats protecting the budgets that are the important ones? I think, uh, getting back to the, the question as well, specifically around the, the health gap, to... To an extent, I, I understand what Chris is saying, but my worry with looking at um, certainly my, uh, my experience of talking with parents that come in, and it is that perception of health, and I think unless you are finding ways to tackle things like mental health, um, to tackle well-being, to tackle um, a sense of resilience, being able to, to, to improve your health yourself. Now, the trouble with that is that the budgets for that are often on the periphery. So although this government may be protecting the health budget per se in terms of hospitals, I, I don't know whether that's true or not, so I'll take Chris's word for that, I do worry that, that around those peripheries then we're reliant on charities, we're reliant on, on areas where we know that budgets are being cut. And so I think if we want to protect that gap, if we want to close it um, and, and have any chance of doing that, then we do need to look to those areas because for, for those who feel less able, who, for those who feel more oppressed, then it's absolutely vital that we have ways of helping them to, to make those journeys for themselves and feel healthy, really. Uh, Laurie McManamy, the, the health budget can sometimes feel like a bottomless pit. Do you think it needs to be targeted? Is it being as well targeted as it could be? Really, I, I'm not a politician, as you well know. In fact, I'm looking along. I'm the only one on the table that's out of work, actually, at the minute. But uh, <laughs> <coughs> the, uh, I'm probably just like uh, somebody that needs national health now and again. Or my family does, or my grandkids do, and whatever. And I've got to say, I mean, my job did take me all around the world. This is the best country for looking after people that are ill. Uh, there are countries who have got no national health, as we, we take it for granted. Um, the little things that I've seen creeping in are like a dentist now. It's very hard to get a dentist where you don't have to pay. And I think that should be looked at by politicians and the dentists should be made to have a proportion of uh, free people and uh, if people can afford to pay, let them do it. But I, honestly, I can't see anything wrong at the moment. Maybe as we are lucky, we're in a good area, we've got a good surgery, but we've never had a problem to see a doctor and I don't think any of my family have either. Cathy asked about, uh, put this in this context of drastic cuts to local authorities as well as the way that the health budget is spent. Has anybody in the audience uh, experienced the, the cuts and the way that they may be impacting particularly the lady in the middle there on those in most need? 
uh, right in the middle, so the microphone may take a moment to get to you. Any, any other thoughts? I could take another couple at this stage, if anyone else has their hand up at all. No? Yes, and there'll be one at the back as well. Right, yes, please. Hi, yeah, I'm from the Stroke Association, um, and many of our services are funded by local authorities, and we're actually in, um, across the country in, in quite a lot of um, difficulty at the moment with budget cuts, particularly with decisions pending. Um, some of our services that are frontline services supporting people with a stroke um, will most certainly close. Um, and it's a real problem that's out there, and it's not just... Um, not just about stroke, but other services dealing with people with disability and other frontline services, as everybody knows. So, yes, it's very real out there. And in the Welfare Reform Bill, Absolutely. how's that likely to affect you then? Um, th that, yes, thank you. That's my question. <laughs> no, you don't have to ask the question, but just in terms yeah. of, of how, how things are, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, obviously, people who have um, survived a stroke will often be left with some sort of disability, which yeah. will mean that they will have to be claiming... Um, some sort of what they will be claiming at the moment incapacity benefit um, and currently the reforms are looking at um, employment support allowance which is actually going to be for less time and we found that 90% of stroke survivors are claiming incapacity benefit, benefit for about three years so that will have some implications mm -hmm. on um, people being able to remain out of work okay. and also supporting people to get back into work as well. Right. So George Hollingbury would you like to maybe talk a bit about that? Okay, if I can just come back to the um, welfare reform in a moment. Just talking about public health for a moment, I've, one of the things I've experienced on the Department of Communities and Local Government Select Committee is a clear understanding as we've travelled around the country that housing is an incredibly important part of people's health. Uh, and if people live in lousy housing, they have lousy health. It's a pretty much one-for-one -one correlation on that. Uh, and the government is doing as much as it possibly can in straightened financial circumstances to get that market moving and to try and find new sources of housing finance. In fact, the committee is doing a report on exactly that issue now. It's an extremely difficult one uh, to deal with. Uh, there are huge amounts of monies out there in the pension markets which we'd love to be able to harness, but trying to find a product that they will back is proving very difficult indeed. But the government itself is uh, trying hard. New homes bonus is payable on every single new home that's built, and 125% of council tax generated by that dwelling is given back to a local council for every affordable home. Um, there's a council tax premium being discussed in the House right now on empty homes. Some 300,000 homes sit empty around this country um, uh, for more than six months uh, on a rolling basis. That's absolutely uh, unacceptable. Uh, and the new bill that's coming through on local government finance also launches TIFs, tax increment financing. That will allow councils to regenerate areas by looking forward to the... Uh, business rates which they'll be able to repatriate at a later date, should regenerate the local areas, should allow more, more housing to come in place and should allow more social housing. And I do think that a really, really important part of that public health jigsaw is good homes, decent homes for regular people and I think we must pursue that. Uh, on the more particular issue of people who are transitioning from uh, incapacity benefit to ESA, to the Employment and Support Allowance, I think it's important to remember there are two strands of ESA. There's the support strand, uh, and there's the, I forget the exact nomenclature, but the people who are there are permanently uh, on ESA. And anybody who's had a stroke who is incapable of looking for work or maintaining a job will be on the support strand, and will mean that that time limit that you talk about, that two-year time limit, will not apply. So this, this is a much more subtle way uh, of dealing with this than, than the previous system. And the whole system of transitioning from incapacity benefit to ESA has been looked over by Malcolm Harrington, Professor Malcolm Harrington, to make sure that that process is properly humanised, that people are recognised for the condition that they're in, that any multiple complexities they might have are properly appreciated, that there's a real genuine face-to-face -face assessment process that, process that goes on. So hopefully there'll be a better way of allocating people to the right strand so that they'll either be looking for work or put on permanent support. George, thank you. There's another question or response up at the back there, which uh, had the microphone. Yeah. Um, yeah. I run an organisation that offers services to people who are homeless um, and in spite of what George has just been telling us about which it, it is true there are a number of good initiatives at the moment that the government is, um, is looking at to do with housing and social housing particularly. The question earlier was about cuts to local authorities mm -hmm. and it's still true as well that most of the local authorities that we work with across the south are taking about a 25-28% cut to their budgets on the sort of supporting people 
um, services that, that organisations like mine run, which means homeless hostels, support to people in day centres and that sort of thing. Now, there's very good evidence to show that people who are homeless, who are being looked after in those kind of services, their health um, is also improved. And we prevent people needing to access A&E services and a whole range of other health services like mental health. So ha having our services is actually... Um, something that saves costs to the health service, but we are being cut. So I think the original question was spot on. Um, even though the main health budgets are being protected, there's a whole range of other ways in which cuts to local authority spending is actually going to be affecting the, um, the health of the community and particularly people who are homeless. So Julie's earlier comments about everything that's around the, the periphery there uh, uh, is absolutely right. Uh, Caroline, would you like to add something to this from the business perspective, possibly, and the, the well, shortage of money there is? I think possibly more from the uh, ordinary person in the street perspective, okay. if you don't mind. Um, not being a politician, I don't have all the facts and figures to hand, but um, in my experience, the National Health Service, whatever the problems are, that if you have an emergency, they're absolutely second to none. If you have a long-term condition, you wait a long time. Um, and... I think that's even worse for people who are perhaps not so able to, to um, communicate and, and press their case, etc., etc. Um, so a, a situation where there needs to be reform in the NHS and the way that the government's trying to bring it through? Yes, I mean, yes, I think so. Right. And, all, and the other thing is, it seems to me, with all this to, to save money, it all comes down to educating people um, in ways as to n not smoking, uh, eating the right sort of food, going and having... Um, uh, tests to prevent illness, etc., because ultimately that investment will save money in the longer term. But I don't know how you do that because, you know, there are people who say, I don't like vegetables. How do you make them like them? <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, there was actually a very good, there was a, there was a study some years ago pointing out that after the end of food rationing after the Second World War, that uh, nutritional standards actually declined. Uh, because food rationing at least ensured everybody got a bit of what got, they... Got an equal uh, amount. What, what they were... Austerity they is were. good for you, is that what um, you're trying to tell us? So uh, there, we, ha we do have... We have, an uphill, we have an uphill task. I'm not suggesting we reintroduce food rationing. Okay. Um, but I, what I am saying is that, I, I, you know, the reality is, let's, let, let's try and put a bit of perspective on all this, which is well, there is going to be, inevitably, we are having to take a lot of tough decisions, and there's no way around that. And I think the fact that this week... You know, the opposition uh, said that they would not be able to reverse the cuts that we had introduced underlines how the economic realities that we have faced and which we've, we've inherited. Let's bring in John um, Denham and, and just see whether he key. thinks... Thank you, Chris. Whether there is an alternative. Yes, there is. Just on what we're still talking about, food. I mean, you need to understand in a city like this that the voluntary organisations operating in Western, the council estate, the other side of the bridge from here are trying to set up their own basics bank, offering food and clothing, rather than rely on the one in the city centre, because people cannot afford the bus fares to get from Western to the city centre. That's actually what we're talking about here, so it's fine having jokes about rationing and all the rest of it. And so Cathy's point about what's happening, not across the city as a whole, but in the parts of the city where the combination of high levels of worklessness, growing unemployment, changes to the benefit system are creating real, real social pressures. Now, I really want to say three things about what should happen. The first is there should be a change in government policy because, yes, we're not saying which cuts we could reverse in three and a half years' time because we've no idea how much more damage will be done in three and a half years' time. But at the moment, the government is cutting too far and too fast. It doesn't mean there wouldn't be any cuts, and I'm not going to pretend that. So the first thing, you could make a difference because if we had more growth, we would have lower levels of unemployment and you'd mitigate some poverty. The second thing is you've got to make some choices because it's going to be a difficult time, whatever you do, about who pays the price. Now, more money is being taken from families with children than is being done through taxation on the banks. And I think that's a wrong choice. You know, it doesn't change the overall money, but that's, that's a choice that you have. And the, the third thing that, that, that really worries me, and even if you forgot about the first point about economic policy and the second point about taxation, uh, trying to talk about the health budget's okay, but many of the families that are most at risk have 
lots and lots of interactions with lots and lots of different people. They have it with schools, they have it with the health service, maybe probation, maybe police, maybe social services and whatever. And actually, we don't use the money in the system at the moment half as efficiently as we could do if different local services work together. And, and one of the things I really fear at the moment, and I pick up from public service professionals, is instead of saying, well, how do we make the best of the limited money we have got to focus it at the families in most needs, everybody's busy trying to shove their costs onto somebody else. If I can save a bit of money here and push the costs onto the health service or onto social services, I can hang on to my budget. And that will not work for those families. So, you know, change the policy, economic policy, I would say, probably won't happen. Secondly, shift the balance about who pays for it. I wish it would happen, it's not. But even within the limited money we've got, we could use it a lot more effectively than we do at the moment if services were encouraged to work more closely together rather than be fragmented. Yes, George. Just to add on, on uh, that exactly that approach is happening. And it, should, it builds on work done by the previous Labour government under uh, total, the Total Place Scheme. And uh, that we now have the Troubled Families Unit run by... Louise Casey, who is taking exactly that approach. In no. fact, she was in front of our committee just last week explaining what she's doing. But you are encouraging the school system to fragment. Yeah. You're encouraging the schools. I mean, I've not got anything against academies. But if you say to schools, you're an island on your own, you don't owe these responsibilities to the wider services. You've made a mistake with Louise. Louise Casey is wonderful, but you have made a mistake because you've added another service on top of the other ones instead of giving local people and local authorities the powers to coordinate the money they've got at the moment. I mean, the aim is fine to concentrate on those troubled families, but I spent ages on this when I was well, a minister. I'm and afraid, it isn't I'm the right afraid that it's actually just, that's just a misunderstanding. There, there is absolutely no doubt that the approach which you advocate, which I think is entirely sensible and right, is exactly what Lewis Casey is in charge of doing. Well, let's see what She's happens. talking about 32 different classes of professional in one particular family she was dealing with a few weeks ago, being focused in, in, on, in on that one family to resolve their issues. And then there are further three more whole place pilots where we are de-siloing those local budgets to ensure that all of those bits of money, all those streams in local government and in national government through the health service and education and the police force and the probation service are all focused in on achieving the best value for money and, most crucially, the best possible effect from those, those, those pounds. Uh, I absolutely agree with you it's the right way. Well, I, hope, I, hope, I hope you're right, but it doesn't look to me well, as though well, that's all. Yeah. Sorry, Chris, if, I just, if I could just have one just quickly, on, yeah. on this, as we yes. on it, and that is simply that I think that one of the other things which we're trying to do, which also, to be fair to the last Labour government, builds on what they were trying to do as well, is move towards a, a greater degree of discretion in how money is being spent to support people in need. And on the social uh, care points, for example, the ability to decide how you want to spend the funded, uh, the, the allocation uh, in, 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 in support for your needs is, I think, introducing a really important element of flexibility, which actually we pioneered a bit here in Hampshire, and which actually helps a lot. So uh, a lot of this is actually stuff where there is cross-party. I can come back to John's point on the economic policy, I, I'm because I, I do, Julie on I do, I do whether politicians are helping at the but moment. But let, let me just, I, I mean, I do think that we need to get a bit real about this, because when we uh, negotiated the coalition agreement uh, the weekend after the general election, the Greek government had its first bond market crisis on the Friday, and we had warnings from the Permanent Secretary of the Treasury and the Governor of the Bank of England that we needed to get that coalition agreement decided and done and dusted before the markets opened on Monday because of the difficulties. Uh, Labour at the time said, we're not Greece, we're not, uh, we don't need to take these sorts of measures to get out of that difficulty. Since then, we've had similar crises to the crises that have attacked Greece uh, in Ireland, in Portugal, in Spain, in Italy, all of these countries uh, actually had smaller deficits uh, than the deficit that we inherited from the Labour Party. Uh, and frankly, the idea that we could in some way not go as far and as fast as we went uh, and get out from that danger zone, I think, is living in cloud cuckoo land. If we had taken John's advice... But it's not working, Chris. If we had taken John's advice, worse. we would have ended up with a double-dip recession no. long before. Well, and that let's, would have been let's, 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 can, can we just, uh, Judy's saying she'll bring us back to reality here. It, it is a different economic situation, isn't it? But do you feel that, they've, that the, the new government has pushed things in a different direction in an unhelpful way as well? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I've just a, a slight quip, but I do remember the weekend of the, of the coalition. That picture of Nick and David is, is probably more firmly in my mind than Wills and Kate. But anyway, that's sort of, you know, bit of a thing. Um, I think, again, just to, to try and come back to that, that original point, John mentioned about um, the worry about academising. And I think the, the difficulty is, is, just as a local authority school, we do feel increasingly isolated. And, and you know, I've been ahead for 17 years, so I'm not unconfident in my job. Um, and I'm also confident enough to do what I believe is right, often over what is perhaps told that I should be doing, but that's a whole other tale, really. Um, but I think uh, talking with some uh, students the other day who, who were actually had all gone through a route of being learning sport assistants and then uh, wanting to become teachers, that's a route that's just been closed to Southampton, interestingly. Um, but that route seemed very, very positive. It was a, a, a way in which they could, could learn, um, often not with many qualifications. They'd gone the long route, that lifelong learning. I'm absolutely committed to They'd gone the long route to do something they really wanted to do in the long term, to become a teacher. I was talking with one of them and, and she'd gone to a lot of different schools, spent a, a fair time with us and she said, the one thing that's different about your school, she said, is that you, you see what needs doing and you, you do it and then you try and find the money to back it up. She said, I haven't seen that happen anywhere else. Anywhere else they know it needs doing, but they look around, and John's point that you try and find somebody else to pick up that budget. Um, interesting, um, a good example would be, and again, it's helping, um, helping long-term around and health and well-being, helping children to go to our after-school club where parents are in crisis, there may be difficulties. I've got several families where there are terminal illnesses, for example, and actually we, we provide that after-school club for them for free because it just seems to be the right thing to do. Yes, we have pupil premium, of course that helps, and I would, you know, I would say that helps. My only worry with pupil premium is that down the line, there is that sense in which, well, you're being given pupil premium, you've got 30% free school meals, you've got 40% of your children have special needs of one, you know, one kind or the other, but actually, because we've given you this, what did you, how much did you say it was? I'm not sure how much it is. 50,000. Was it 50,000? Because got we've it. got this 50,000. <laughs> because we've got this 50,000. Did you get million, it all? Are you sure? <laughs> somewhere here. Um, <laughs> in, a, in a million and a half budget, bear in mind. So because you've got this money, then actually all of these children with all these disadvantages have to do exactly the same. Come out at 11, having done exactly the same as anybody else, all those people with all the advantages, all the, you know, all the, um, all the care and the love and the support and the homework helping and all of those things, they've got to do the same. And I think it's just about, yes, this pupil premium is great. It helps us to do all those other things around the periphery that I was talking about. But we do need to see learning as a lifelong journey because it doesn't all happen at 11. Sometimes it takes longer. We just need to make sure that advocates there for those children young people to help them succeed in the long run. Okay. Can I just make a, a really... I think we'll... I think we've been through the economy, through uh, health to education. Um, if we could just go back to Cathy Pope and say, what did you think of those answers? Uh, and get her the microphone. And then we'll move on to another slightly different subject. Sorry, Chris, but um, I think that it's criminal that in a city like Southampton, there are people who have to go to a food bank because they cannot eat, because they cannot afford to eat, and they cannot get the bus across the river so that they can get to one of the places that might supply them food. And I think in a world where we allow people to avoid paying taxes and we give bankers bonuses and we do all of those kinds of things because your government thinks it's a good thing to do and we let people, we let children go to school without breakfast so they cannot right. learn. I actually think that is criminal. That is, and those gaps between the rich and the poor children are getting so bigger and bigger and bigger. Don't and you are not doing anything in the coalition government, as far as I can see, either locally or nationally, to help that situation. Well, and all I can I, see I, is that that will get worse and worse. That is Let's so let him answer, unfair. Kathy. That is, that is so unfair. Remember, we're actually raising more money from the banks than the last government did with, through the bankers' levy. Not Remember, enough. No, it may not be enough, and, and obviously we're looking further at what we can do on that, and we're particularly looking at the issue of 
high pay, and that's what Vince Cable uh, is currently working on. But let's be realistic. We are raising more money from the banks. We are raising more money from capital gains because we put up capital gains tax. You don't hear about that. We are not proceeding with any ideas of cutting inheritance tax because, like David Lloyd George, I happen to think the most convenient time to tax rich people is when they're dead. Uh, and it, so please give the government credit for what it is actually doing to try. We're the first government ever to produce in the budget documents an analysis, the first government ever to produce in the budget documents an analysis of which income groups are actually going to be affected uh, by our tax and spending measures. No government has ever done that. Not a Labour government. And you can read exactly what the impact is. I don't, no government has ever been so concerned to be transparent and open about how we're dealing with these problems and to try and deal with them fairly. Uh, now, I entirely agree these are rough circumstances, and it is always the case when you go through rough economic times like the ones that we're going through that those who are most vulnerable often do get hurt the most. But we are trying very hard to concentrate help on where it's needed and to make sure that those with the broader shoulders bear the greatest burden. Okay, thank you very much. Let's uh, take a different question from Jordan Turner. If you could put your hand up so the microphone can get to you. Uh, Jordan Turner, who has... Is he here? At the back? Good, good. Uh, we've talked a bit about spending cuts, but this takes us in a slightly different direction. Jordan. My question is that uh, with so many of the spending cuts adversely affecting young people, such as cuts to jobs, tuition fees and EMA funding, um, would you agree that lowering the voting age would protect these young people and stop them from being such an easy target? So it's about involving young people more. It's their future. Um, Laurie McMenemy, I know, does a lot of work with older people. But what do you think about giving younger people more of a say? Are you referring to my football team when you said <laughs> um, I'm A bit of both. I mean, I've got into the older region because of age concern. I think that's what you're getting at there. But younger people, I think... Now and again, I mean, I've listened, and it's all a bit political for me, and the honour about people who go to school without any breakfast. I mean, I'd have a look at the parents first and say, look, why are they going without breakfast? Is it because you're wasting money on beer and fags or whatever? You know, it's not always politicians' fault that that happens. Um, but then you'll get youngsters who, even if they have got a bad background, who shine. And I saw that in sport, in football. You could get a load of lads lined up the same age, the same sort of ability, and then when you really put them under pressure or question them, certain lads will shine. And it's got nothing to do with how rich they are or where the, what the background is. It's, it's an inner built thing. Now, you can't afford really to go right through all what teenagers, 16-year-olds or whatever you think the voting age should be to pick them out. So I think the safe way is to have one age across the lot and hope that by then they've all got enough common sense to know what they're doing. I mean, when I was 18, I didn't have any option. I had to go into the Army, uh, or the Navy, or the Air Force. But because I was six foot odd, I was put in the... I got a letter from the Queen. I was quite impressed. She said, will you mind popping down to London, she said, and uh, getting a red hat on, a red thing on, a black hat, and guard me outside Buckingham Palace. I thought, thank you very much. In other words, it was national service and I didn't have any option. So I was, I was <laughs> clever enough then to fight for my country. So at 18, I think anybody should be given the opportunity to have a vote. Uh, any younger, no. I think 18 is not a bad age. And uh, that applies right across everything I've, I've been involved with. Caroline. Um, I don't think lowering the um, voting age is going to solve any problems. I think, I think people are probably not, forgive me saying it, quite mature enough then. I think what has to happen is to, to uh, have a way so that there don't have to be so many cuts, which means stimulating the economy. I mean, the two things, sorry, I'm going to rant now. Please the two don't. things I think really need tackling are still the question of the banks. Borrowing, banks are not lending money, whatever anybody says. If you are in business, I'm, I'm a partner in a small business, 
um, and it's, uh, trying to borrow money is incredibly difficult. Um, if you can, mo most people are turned down. There is a box ticking system nowadays. There is no looking at an individual business, the history of it. I've heard tales of banks who have dealt with the companies who are perfectly solvent for years and won't lend them some small amount, relatively small amount of 30,000 pounds for a project. If you do, if they are prepared to do it, it takes so long. It can take months for a deal from when it's agreed to the paperwork to the money. People, uh, entrepreneurs can lose opportunities in that time. It's absolutely hopeless, frankly. And, and all the figures can be uh, fixed. So the idea that uh, a bank might say, oh, well, they approve four out of five applications. They probably do. But that's only because only those get past the, a certain stage in, in the first place. A lot are rejected before. So I feel very, very strongly about that. I think it, we, everything now is far too bureaucratic. Everything now is ticking a box. No looking at individuals, no looking at anything like that. Something's got to be done about it, um, and you've got to give people a chance. We don't want to go back to the reckless lending of before, but there is a, there is a halfway measure. The other thing that uh, has got to happen and, uh, is employment law. In a business, it is so difficult. You can have the most dreadful employee, but trying to uh, get rid of them is a very long process, and there's always the threat, you're going to be in a tribunal. If you're in a tribunal, it's not worth the time, the effort, you end up paying somebody off. And the, the, I, I understand the principle, you're trying to protect people. And it doesn't mean that employers are all cavalier and want to treat their employees badly. Far from it. But if things are far more flexible, it would mean you could employ somebody, even if it's only a short term, give people jobs. They have a chance to prove themselves. Now, we're all scared stiff. We can't do anything. So you don't do it. And then, how does that help people? Right. So, George Hulling, over. Jo thank you. For George, George Hollingbury, tie that together. <laughs> you've, you've run businesses. You've now gone in recently into yeah, politics. Um, and the future, which you'd like to see improve, Caroline, is, yeah. is what those young people are going to have to get involved with and, and, you know, have to and change. There is a fundamental contradiction, is there not, between what the government is trying to do with banks. That one, on the one hand, they're trying desperately to get them to lend to SMEs. And I get exactly the same stories Caroline's talking about every day from constituency businesses who have long established... Uh, businesses that they cannot get finance for. On the other hand, we've got banks that need to be more solvent, that need more capital, that need to be more robust. And we need to be absolutely certain they're not landing to people who can't afford to take on those debts. And it is a very, very difficult square to circle. And I have to say that it takes the wisdom of Solomon to understand how we're going to make that happen. There are only so many government uh, levers that can be pulled in this. And at the moment, I can't see an easy way through it. Uh, it's a very, very difficult problem. In on employment law, the government is acting. There are some um, actions coming through that are going to make it uh, less onerous on businesses from the employment uh, point of view. Now, that isn't to say that we ought to be reducing the rights of people to take employers to court if they have clearly been flagrantly wrong. That would be quite inappropriate and quite improper. But there, it is, at the moment, too easy, and I've had plenty of experience with this directly, I have to say in my own businesses, it is too easy for employees to recognise how much it costs for companies to take action against them or to take on lawyers to advise them and to pitch their claims at a level that make it nearly impossible for the company to do anything other than pay a fee over. Uh, and I have to say, that is just wrong. There are lots of other regulations in business that need dealing with. Uh, health and safety needs reducing. It is entirely right and proper that we have more health and safety than we used to. There's no question about that. There are plenty of dangerous professions out there that are now better regulated than they were before. But there is now an all-pervading attitude in all levels of government and in lots and lots of businesses that lots of things should not be done purely because health and safety is too difficult to deal with. And that is another area where I really think we ought to, to be making a real difference, and indeed the government intends to do so. Just to pop back to the voting age question, since that's the one we were asked up front, my, my experience on this is I run classes quite often in schools in my constituency, and generally what I have is sort of the, the more able children and I run a parliament with them. And one of the questions I always put forward to them as a potential bill to bring forth before parliament, that's what we do, is would you like to see the voting age lower to 16? And I am dealing generally with kids who are going to be the ones who would be more likely to vote between 16 and 18. And universally, in every single circumstance that I've ever had, they have rejected the idea. Uh, that tells me something, I think, more about the general 
view amongst younger people about whether or not they're at the right age to vote or not uh, than anything I'd hear from, from politicians. Certainly, it's, it's at least to me a very valuable input on that. Children, kids, young people are actually ultimately in, uh, much more interested in politics across the board, in life as it generally is, not just about EMA, not just about tuition fees, not just about the prospect for jobs, though all of those things are incredibly important to them. They are intelligent people like the rest of us. They have opinions on the NHS, on defence and so on and so forth. And I think, ultimately, you have to make a judgment about what age you believe somebody has reached maturity. And I think, like Laurie, that 18 is as good as any age. Let's have a quick vote. How many people in the audience think that uh, 16 would be a good age to start voting? And how many think that's absolutely wrong, leave it as it is? Mm, uh, there's a substantial number I'd like to see it lowered, but probably slightly more against, I'd say. Given the that? age of the audience, Peter, I think you should yes. ask whether people think we should raise the voting age <laughs> to 21, no, no, or no, even no. 35, which, of course, it used to be for women. Yeah. All right. Is that uh, a firm proposal, a Secretary of State? Unfair. No, that's, that's just one. Uh, Chris, would you like, what do you think on the voting age? Well, uh, the, I, is I it important? Actually, is it I important? Do, I do think that there is an argument that, you know, if people <coughs> are old enough to work and old enough to, which actually very soon they're not going to be at the age of 16, but... Uh, at the moment, uh, they can and they can pay taxes. Then they, you know, taxation without representation is uh, is an old cry um, from Amer the American colonialists. So I think that it would make sense. And that our party, the Liberal Democrats, is actually in favour of uh, reducing the voting age to 16. Although the coalition agreement doesn't specify anything on this, and there won't be any plans under this uh, under this government. Uh, but just the, the premise of it was that somehow we had not taken into account the interests of young people because they weren't voting. And I'm not sure that's uh, actually the case. If you look, for example, at uh, uh, the tuition fees issue, uh, one of the things that we're doing is that we have raised the uh, uh, point at which people begin to pay back for uh, their loans from 15,000 a year to 21,000 a year, which is actually the median income in this country. So anybody who comes out of college or university uh, earning less than median earnings is actually not going to pay anything for their university education at all. And a whole new class of people who previously were unable to access any university finance, which would be particularly, I hope, relevant to uh, those who are in Southampton City College, part-time uh, students can now get support. Part-time students never had support before. And I'm very proud of those two changes. Uh, take, for example, what was said about the EMA. The, the, the reality on EMA is that we are raising, in line with what the last Labour government proposed, the school leaving age to 18 anyway. So the question was, the EMA was going to go when that happened. Uh, the question was whether we bring it forward uh, by a short amount of time in order to save some money. And I'm afraid saving money is absolutely inevitable in the circumstances we're in. How do we make a very tight budget go as far as we can and direct it as much as possible to those who need it? So I don't accept the premise, but I do accept that actually votes at 16 make, make sense. Yeah, Chris, it's quite convenient for Liberal Democrats, isn't it, that uh, you won't be proceeding with lowering the voting age, given the reaction to what happened with tuition fees. No. Most young <laughs> people... As I say, I don't accept the premise. The reality is that I, I don't think we but did... But it's it. not popular. I, I do you not haven't think, won people round, I do it? not think we did a very good job as a government in explaining the policy that we have introduced, but that what we've actually done is substantially fairer than the scheme which we inherited from the last Labour government. It's fairer because rubbish. it's fairer. It's not <coughs> rubbish. Just look at what happened. You don't pay back unless you earn more than 21,000. At the moment, under the old Labour scheme, you pay back as soon as you earn 15,000 pounds. You actually pay the more you earn. Grand instead of 21. I mean, well, be a bit different. Well, well, obviously, if look, look, if somebody goes through medical school and earns 100,000 pounds on average as a GP, it seems to me it is fair that they should pay more than people who go out of university or college and pay less than 21. Caroline, let's just have. Uh, we'll come to you in a second, John. Caroline. From the point of view of, of people nowadays, I mean, my eldest son, who's a sort of very cautious lad, and um, I've always sort of taught people you've got to save money and you've got to economise and if you can't afford to buy it, you don't buy it. He's worried to death about the fact that he's going to have this loan uh, when he goes to university in, in October. And but Chris is saying he shouldn't be worried. But he, just he hasn't should be worried because you don't, why should you have to go out and, and the country's in the mess because people have been able to borrow money, have credit all over the time, have debts and, and 
How does this help? I just think that Look, it's... I would love to be starting from somewhere else. Right. But we are starting from where we're starting, where we have a real problem with finance. I wish we could have completely free education. As a, as a good liberal, the, uh, absolutely on principle, I really do believe that everybody should have access to free education. All right? okay. But the, the reality is, in the short run, we have a serious problem which we have First, to John Benham. Firstly, you got it wrong in the coalition agreement, because the, even the IMF today, like the ratings agency last week, are saying that there's so much austerity across countries like this one that that is what is stopping the world economy growing. So you've actually made that wrong decision. You damaged the economy. The IMF actually it was a bad. It was a bad. It was a bad. It was a bad mistake to just take out all of the public funding of virtually every university course that's not science or medicine. Because we've had a system of partnership, and I don't think there's anything wrong having one child third year at university, one having recently graduated, of saying that students who do benefit personally make a contribution towards it. But you have switched that massively over to individuals. You gave no thought to students on EMA, including those in this college here, who lost their EMA in the middle of their courses. Because there was no, because when we talk about too far, too fast, part of too far, too fast is taking decisions that take no account of what's going to happen to the individuals involved. So I actually think the government, I mean, let me give you another example. We had a thing in government called the Future Jobs Fund, which meant that a young person who was out of work for six months got six months' work. It wasn't perfect, it didn't guarantee them a job at the end of the six months, but it stopped that cycle of long-term youth unemployment and actually meant that many got into work because they could go to an employer with a CV saying, I've done a job, I've held it down for six months. That was scrapped within a month of the new government coming in. The youth contract, which replaces it, doesn't start till April. Now, to have 18 months of no targeted provision for young people was wrong because we've now seen a doubling of the number of young people not out of work but out of work for more than six months. Now I think a government that have been really focused on young people, even if you say, because I've never tried to pretend I was responsible for this policy, we would have made no cuts in higher education, love to do so at a UCU audience, but I'm not going to say that there wouldn't have been cuts under a Labour government. It could have been done in a way that took more care about what was going to happen to young people's lives. Now, having said that, let's come back to the question. Look, I'm going to be actually with, with George and, and Laurie on this one, although I have a horrible feeling it's my own party's uh, policy to have votes of 16. But um, <laughs> I think that the, 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 I'm nothing against it, but you've got to really persuade me you would get a significant turnout of voters at 16 and 17. And, and whenever the real studies have been done, the evidence has been that you engage 15, 20% of young people enthusiastically at that age. We already have the worst turnout levels at between 18 and 21. And it's a very populist thing to say as a, a, as a politician. <laughs> I'm sure my party said so. But I mean, I th personally, I've got to tell you the honest answer. I am as yet unpersuaded that if we lowered the voting age, you would get the sort of respectable turnout levels that we need. Let's try to persuade. Do, what I do hope. Shall we? Well, I, what, here well, I, what I do hope, though, is that the group of young people who may have not voted at the last election, thinking they're all the same, it makes no difference, whichever they, way they're going to vote in the future, do now know that which politicians you vote for does make a big difference to what actually happens. Right. A young person who would like to vote, please. Come on. Let's have a, there's a hand in the middle, please. The guy with the blue jacket. And another one as well. There's the girl with the red one. You've had your hand up for a while. If we could have the microphone there as well, please. You first. Um, I'm a member of uh, the UK Youth Parliament, and I'd just like to say that recently we ha uh, sat in the House of Commons, and that beforehand we had a vote of what we wanted to uh, discuss in the House of Commons, and there was si a turnout of about 65,000 uh, votes from young people, which I think shows that there is the turnout there, f uh, turnout out there for uh, young people who want to vote. And I say, does this actually affect your opinion on? Voting its age do, do, do you think by being given some real power, people would at, at 16 would start thinking about some of the issues a bit more and taking it more seriously? Yeah, I do uh, think that they'd be more interested because, I, like I said, personally, as a member of the Youth Parliament for mm. uh, the but that, National... that's you. What about everybody else? Like I said, I, yeah. as I represent a large area, yeah. quite a lot of the young people I talk to say uh, what their opinions are on the government, but they don't actually get to show their opinion because okay. they don't have the... Uh, 
vote pink. And two down, please, as well. You too, yeah. Although I do understand that giving them the power does give them the ability to feel involved, um, I believe until the point that we incorporate it into education and they have some political knowledge, um, I do believe that they have too many pressures, um, things about their future, how they will afford to go to uni, all these things are spilling around their head at the, at the, at the time, and to add an extra burden to them about um, thinking about political choices, what they want to do, I don't think we will receive the turnout okay. that Thank we you. would like. And just next to you as well, and then we'll come back to Julie. Yeah, I think I agree with what Hayden was saying. I think before we can even, compre even comprehend um, lowering the voting age, um, I think we've got to offer a better uh, political and PSHG education for all, mm. because the, um, the space between being 16 and 18 um, I'm 16 myself, and it seems it's, it's getting up the ladder and with the demands for university being so high to get in, to get your place, mm -hmm. um, and the, the challenge to get there. It's just, about, it's just about getting there, maybe not taking in your surroundings, and perhaps, perhaps as well, I think okay. that with the education that will give us the roots to take on the problems that you describe, to take that on as the future generation. Okay. Thank you. Julie, Julie Greer, last word to you. Just the fact that the, the young people who have just spoken now recognise that there is a correlation between a vote and having a responsibility completely encourages me because I think we're all making an assumption that beyond 18, all those with the vote, um, you know, actually are mature, are, you know, have the intellect to work out what the, the difference between the political parties are, what we really want from the manifestos, whether the manifestos actually have anything to do with what happens afterwards. Um, and I think within that. Oh. Sorry, that was too. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, we are a rights respecting school at Cherbourg, and what we do is we teach the United Nations um, Convention on the Rights of the Child, and we, and we learn through it as well. And one of those rights is that children and young people have the right um, to be involved in decisions that affect them. I mean, what, what decisions could affect them more than how we are politically run in the country? So I, I actually do think, and I, I have thought long and hard about it. I was initially sort of thinking, you know, very similar thoughts, all not old enough sort of thing. But actually, I do believe that a lot of young people um, want to get involved. They want to feel that they are part of the, the big system that we've got. And I, like I say, I was really encouraged by what you said this evening. Um, the more we do teach within schools is really important. The more we help children and young people to understand that, like I say, there is that correlation, the better we will be um, for the future, where we maybe one day will have 70% turnout. You never know, even 80. Let's hope so. Let's uh, move on to another subject, if that's all right. Um, Jonathan Cheshire, Chief Executive of the Wheat Sheaf Trust, has a snappy question, and the microphone will come to you. So you can put that to our panel. How does, how does welfare to work work if there is no work? <laughs> Let's start with John Denham this time. There are two parts to the question, I think. Firstly, I don't know, Peter, I won't try your patience and go back over economic policy, but I think that things could be done differently that would produce more jobs in uh, our economy. The second thing, though, and I will say this, we need to be careful not to look at welfare and think if there are no jobs, we run an, a welfare system on the assumption that nobody can find their way into work. I think it is actually very important that the starting and ending point of the welfare system for those of working age and for those who are capable of work is always about making attempts to keep people in touch with the, the, the labour market, make sure that people have got skills, have constantly got the, the support, the advice, the encouragement to keep the aspiration for work alive. I think that's absolutely essential because there is nothing more corrosive than the sense that there's no chance of working, no expectation of work, no aspiration to work. So, and I think the way we do our welfare system uh, has changed a lot in that direction. The second thing is a welfare system is not only for unemployment long term, it's for people who have misfortunes and lose their jobs. And one of the things that I regret over changes that have happened over a 20, 30 year period of time 
is the idea of the welfare system as a contributory system, something where you were rewarded for what you put in and uh, saw something perhaps extra because in the old language you had paid your stamps, you had paid in, has largely been lost for our welfare system at the moment. It is almost, not entirely, but almost entirely means tested on your immediate needs. Now, I think, therefore, we've got two challenges to the future. Uh, three challenges. One is to get the economic policy right so you maximize the number of jobs, and they are there. Secondly, you actually run a welfare system that is constantly saying, we're going to give you a chance to get into work. That's why I talked about the Future Jobs Fund earlier, because it, it said to young people after six months, actually, there wasn't under the Future Jobs Fund an option of just getting benefit because you didn't fancy taking something under the Future Jobs Fund. I mean, you were expected to go and do it, and it worked for people. So you have to have a system that's constantly focused on work. Longer term, I think we need to take the brave decision to say, let's rebuild the system with more sense of contribution so that people have a sense of uh, getting something out of it. And let me give you a, third, a final reason why that's important. You will only get popular support for a welfare system if the working population, as well as the population that's not working, think it's fair. One of the things that I found quite a searing experience during the recession of 2008, 2009, was of people who had probably been constantly in work for the past 20 years being unemployed for the first time. And many of them had no idea how little you got. No, many of them had no idea you wouldn't get any help with your mortgage for it. It was initially six months. We brought that back to three months. We thought that was great. But they were all saying, I don't get any help for three months. If I was on housing benefit, I get it straight away. So there was that sense of, you know, I paid in all my life. What was there to show for it? And the reason that's important is that most of those people, even today with the economic problems, are now back in work. But they have a real attitude, when I find when I go on the doorstep, of people saying, I don't like paying in for this system that didn't offer me very much when I needed it. So you do have to build a welfare system that works for people who are mainly in work, who are currently fall on hard time of losing their job, being made redundant, getting sick before they get back into work, as well as for people who've got long-term problems and will need a great deal of assistance to get into work. Sorry, but many. Um, I can only talk generally from sport. It hasn't changed. If you're good enough, there's a job. In fact, there's more opportunities now in sport. Uh, in football, for instance, I could never sign a boy until he was 14-year-old on a schoolboy form. Now I read where they can join up with clubs' academies at 8-year-old. I don't agree with it, but that's what's happening. Uh, why I don't agree with it is because between 8-year-old and 16, they're going to change physically, mentally, and at some stage, somebody's going to have to tell them, sorry, you're not good enough and they'll go back to school with a tail between their legs, and the, the, the other lads will probably turn them off football for life after that. But there is big opportunities. I mean, I get involved a, a bit with Solent University. The sports courses there are getting bigger and wider. More and more pupils coming in. We've got a good rate of people going into sport, not just to play sport, but on the admin side, the commercial side, the coaching side. And uh, they're also getting involved with the bodies that run sport. So from that point of view, I can only see success. On the other side of it, I'm just like anybody that reads the papers and comes up against the odd politician now and again. And I must tell you, some of them are quite odd. And, um, <laughs> and I would say on behalf of a lot of people, you know, when you read about the foreign people coming in and taking jobs, now that gentleman's probably talking about a higher level of job than the ones that we read about. Um, like labouring jobs and jobs on the farm and whatever, and, and employers say, oh, we'll have him because he'll take less money. What are we doing as a government, or politicians in general, to stop all this sort of thing happening, where people come in and take jobs that would normally have been given to our people? When you say take jobs... Well, the, the, the jobs are there. Um, two people go for it. The, the employer will take the foreign fellow who's come in illegally sometimes, I suppose, from what I read, uh, and he'll take less money. So he appoints him, and to be fair, they, they, they must work hard, otherwise they wouldn't keep the job. I was going to say, people but coming from abroad are doing the jobs. Less money, but should we not be a bit more selfish and look after our people, look after us first, or is the opposite argument that our people are spoilt and they don't want to work as hard. They don't want to do, do the manual jobs. I don't know. I would ask that gentleman there. I don't know whether 
you found it as an employer or as someone yourself who needs work and can't get it now that used to. But there's definitely been a change uh, of, I mean, the area I came from, the northeast, I came from Gateshead, a small Caribbean type town up in the northeast. And, uh, <laughs> you, you know, when I was a young lad, everybody up there was a Geordie. But now, the multitude of different nationalities, and I've got note against that, I'm not racist by any means, but people are flooding in, they're flooding in and taking jobs. Apparently, so I read, now the politicians may tell me I'm wrong, but that may be the answer to your question. George Hollingbury, it is now proven, isn't it, that people coming from abroad have uh, taken a proportion of jobs there are in this country? Indeed it is, and um, I, I think I can only... Uh, re-emphasize one thing, which is that an employer has a choice at any one stage, and for some reason in this country, employers are choosing, particularly for manual jobs, particularly for mechanical jobs, they're choosing to, to, bring, well, to, to employ the person who presents themselves with, well, unsurprisingly, with, with more enthusiasm and more hard work. Now, in some cases, that is the, that's the British person who presents himself, and in some cases, it isn't. But in many cases, it appears not to be, and I have no particular explanation for that, but it's certainly an observation. I've recently had some building works done. Every single person employed by the very talented um, uh, builder contractor I brought in was Polish or from Eastern Europe. He assures me that he cannot keep an English person or a British person on his books for long enough to want to keep them there for the long term, and I can only give that to you as reportage. Um, his, his polls do a better job for him on time, they turn up regularly, uh, and there is definitely something there that, that is making it more difficult for British people to find jobs when in competition with those from overseas. Uh, I make no particular value commentary about that, but it is simply an observation. Can I just say one thing about the employment generally? The, the question was, how can you have welfare to work when there isn't necessarily any work? And clearly, the economy plays a large part in that. But I have to say, for the first time in, in sitting on a panel of this sort, I have absolutely nothing to say other than what our Labour representative, John Denham, just said. It was entirely sensible, entirely right, and I couldn't disagree with a, wor a word of it. The work programme is in place, hopefully perhaps a little late, uh, replacing what was there before, but there is a very, very clear route towards work. Yes, there has to be the job there at the end of it, but as he describes, there's a journey that everyone needs to undertake and to be kept on if they can't get there. There's nothing more dispiriting uh, than being sitting there doing absolutely nothing, and I'm absolutely convinced that there are remarkably few people in this country who actually want to sit on benefits. Uh, I've certainly met very, very few of them. I hear about a great many of them, but I meet very, very few of them. Most people I know want a job but sometimes they're not there and they've got to be kept on that journey. There's also something about the quality of the job at the end. Uh, and I hope that universal credit, which is the new system the government's bringing in, that allows a taper, a way of relief, so it allows you to retain at least 35p in every pound that you earn, uh, is going to make a difference because you'll be able to go past that terrible cliff edge that currently exists at 16 hours of employment where huge numbers of people don't, get, don't take work beyond 16 hours because so much of their benefits fall away that they cannot afford to move beyond that. Hopefully, and there's a big hope because there's huge amounts of IT involved and all sorts of complexities, but hopefully that will allow people to keep on transitioning, to keep going up the work ladder, to produce something for their family that's worth having, worth keeping, and takes them further and further. So there's something about the quality of the job and the prospects of the job at the end of the day as well. Can I just, we'll come to you, Chris, in a second. <coughs> just ask Jonathan Cheshire. Um, your suggestion is pe people can't be moved from welfare to work if there is no work. Uh, but is it people also not wanting to move, as has been suggested by a couple of the people here? I think there's a very small element of that. I think, I, I, I don't disagree with anything John said or, or, or George um, Hollinghurst. But um, the... There is a simple mathematical issue. We have uh, 2.7 million unemployed as of Wednesday. There are approximately 400,000 vacancies in the British economy. So unless George Osborne is going to produce uh, 2.3 uh, million jobs in the next three years, there are going to be a very large number of people who are going to be out of work for quite a long time. The work program will cater for about 7% of the claimants. It's a very small program. There's been a lot of noise about it, and actually, I've got no particular objection to the work programme. It's a very intelligent response to the 2008 labour market. Unfortunately, we're in 2012 now. And <clears throat> the, so I think, in a sense, I'm agreeing with John. We need to have, as well as moving people towards work, as well as insisting on that journey, which I've got absolutely no argument with, 
we have to have programs in place that deal with people that are going to be out of work for a long time. We've got to keep them active, in touch, improving their skills. We need a lot more things like the Future Jobs Programme to keep people active who are, who are simply not going to get jobs okay. in, the, in the near future. Jonathan Cheshire, thank you. Uh, the, uh, a quick word from you, just, just a quick one. Well, I mean, just one of the reasons that didn't want to get onto the economic policy. We, we proposed the extra tax on banks, say, on banks, because you could use that to fund housing construction. You could use it to fund a jobs program for young people. Those choices are possible now and could be done this year, and we think they should be. Okay. And uh, <laughs> Chris Hewn has got a fearsome-looking book of book of numbers with HM Treasury on. So, as a former economist, I'm worried. I but... was trying to uh, look up the, the figures. Um, let, let me make a couple of, of, of points first. I, mean, I entirely agree with the general point that unemployment is the, uh, you know, the, is the scar on the current economic situation which we have to address the most urgently because we know from past experience that the longer people are out of work, the more difficult it is for them to find work in the future. That's partly because employers tend to fight shy and it's partly because they lose the habits of work. So uh, I think it's absolutely crucial that we get young people who've been out of work for any length of time into the labour market. That's why the youth contract is there. It is a different scheme to the one that John had with the Future Jobs Fund because it's more private sector oriented and it's meant to ensure that people actually hopefully have jobs all the way through. But it's not the only thing we're doing on young people. One of the things we did from the very beginning was to dramatically increase the number of apprenticeships. Because learning a skill uh, in this sort of economic environment is absolutely crucial. And the increase in the number of apprenticeships is actually 163,000 between the 2010-11 uh, academic year and the 9,000 of them were for 16 and 18 year olds. The biggest increase was in apprenticeships for older people in the workforce, which is great, but it had no effect on young people. Well, it's obviously, that, look, there's an overall 58% increase in apprenticeships. We want to see that going on, uh, and that is very crucial. But let, let, you know, having, having said that, let me make a few more positive points because I know it's appalling the economic situation and it's appalling the uh, unemployment situation. But I do think that there are some things we need to bear in mind which are more positive. First of all, in my area, in the, in the area of low carbon uh, goods and services, this sector is no longer a cottage industry. It's now employing a million people and it is growing very rapidly and it has continued to grow all the way through the recession, more than 4% a year. And if you look at what we're bringing forward on the Green Deal as an energy saving program at the end of this year, we're anticipating that those employed in insulation, which nationally are about 27,000, we're at the very minimum we'll get that up to 65,000, we could get 100,000 by uh, 2015. The only other point that I would say is that there are quite a lot of things that can be done locally. I'm very proud of the fact that Eastleigh Council, for example, pioneered and won beacon status from the Labour government uh, for its economic development work uh, because, for example, it took the risk of buying an old office building, Wessex House, as a business incubator. And lots and lots of small businesses in the local area started off with a room in Wessex House, which is the easiest way for them to get started. And they're now, they've grown, they've moved out, they're employing other people, and that's a very practical thing. And one final point I'd like to make is that before everybody gets in total uh, despair about the economic situation, about the unemployment situation, it is worth bearing in mind that even in a very bad economic situation, there is an enormous amount of dynamism within the economy. I've mentioned the low carbon goods and services. But if you look at the unemployment figures that are published every month, broadly, when they're going up, the numbers who are losing their job are slightly higher than the numbers going into work. But broadly, it's about 300,000 each way. So every month, there are 300,000 new jobs across the economy and 300,000 losing, uh, losing their jobs. If more are losing their jobs than are gaining, then that's bad news. But there is a dynamism there, and we shouldn't lose faith in the capacity of our economy to regenerate itself. We're trying to rebalance the economy towards manufacturing uh, to make sure that we take advantage of opportunities uh, overseas, and we will do that. We have a lot of very good skills great entrepreneurs, we've got, to try and put the, uh, we've got to try and put the framework in place where that can happen. But overall, 
over this whole period since the election, we've actually still, despite the increase in unemployment, we've seen an increase in overall employment. And the increase in employment in the private sector has more than compensated for some of the job losses, which because of the cuts, we've had to see in the public sector. Julie. One of the points I wanted to make, and may well be relevant on the back of what Chris has just said, and certainly may, it may in itself be prejudicial in terms of, of your builder, but my, my worry is about... Uh, is that the conditions of employment must not become a casualty of the difficulties that, that we face, really, with um, unemployment and with trying to find people work. Because, you know, my premise would be that your builder can employ people who don't actually mind having a job for a week, for a day, not knowing whether in that morning they're going to have a job or not. I'm aware of certainly um, two... Uh, people within um, the school community, and, I, and there may be many more, it's just that I'm aware of their stories because they've, they've made them public, who, who's, who have lost five jobs since September. Now that's quite, I mean, on the one hand, that's really impressive they've had five jobs, but they've lost five jobs. Now they actually do mind that they keep losing jobs, but they get back up and they get back out there and they get into another job. Now that's, that worries me because what, what, kind of terms and conditions are those people um, being employed on? And, and again, maybe I am being prejudicial, Chris, but my worry would be that if private sector are employing a huge number more people, are they there in safe jobs? Are they jobs that maybe may go tomorrow, may go the next day? And I think we mustn't lose sight of that. And although, you know, it may, it's easy to accuse, um, you know, to accuse that attitude of being overly PC, but it is really important, isn't it, if we want people to to feel good about going into the workplace, then they have to have a confidence. They have to need to, you know, they need to feel in themselves that when they sit in that job interview, they have a reasonable chance of still being in that job within a month, within three months. And I think we mustn't lose sight of that. Okay, can I just count upon that very quickly? Please? Just quickly, then. Uh, and then I'll finish with Caroline. Just, 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 just coming to that particular example, I mean, I, Polish Pete and Big Ben, who are the two Polish guys working for um, Steve Adams, the, the guy I'm talking about, have been with him for eight years, have moved their families across uh, from Poland. Who, and, and I just, I do, but I do think we need to be really careful. We need not to sit here in denial and pretend to ourselves that there isn't a problem here, because there is. And, and Laurie articulates it. Now, not everyone in this, in this audience may be entirely comfortable with how he's articulating it, but it's, a, it's an observation that I think has real weight. Given a choice, a lot of our employers are not taking British people. When they're presented with two people, they will very often go for the Eastern European. And I think we need to begin to ask ourselves why. Okay. <laughs> it certainly does. Can yeah. I make one point on this, on this issue of, 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 of foreign uh, migrants? And that is simply that uh, we should bear in mind two things uh, overall. First of all, there is no historical relationship between uh, increases in people coming into the labor market for whatever reason, whether they're immigration or whether, for example, it was the enormous demobilization after the Second World War of people coming out of the armed services. You can have enormous increases in the labor force that don't lead to increases in unemployment because this isn't a fixed pool. This is a very dynamic economy. It can expand. Second thing that's worth bearing in mind, particularly when we start talking about our Polish friends, is that more British people work in other member states of the European Union than people from other member states of the European Union work here. So if anybody is inclined, uh, and you hear this occasionally from people like UKIP, to say we're going to pull the drawbridge up and say Poles go home, well actually we'll have more Brits coming back because you can believe, bet your bottom dollar that if we chuck out uh, other members of the European Union, the same thing will happen in reverse. And I think a lot of people I know from constituents and others who actually have positively relished going to other member states of the European Union, working for a period, not as I say, and it's not all our vida zane pet, but I mean the reality is we've had, we take those opportunities and more of us take those opportunities okay. than, than they do. The last word then to Caroline, please. Yeah, two things. One is um, that um, last year, uh, we employ, we want, needed a secretary in our business and uh, we actually employed somebody who had just graduated from Southampton University with a 2-1 in law. She said rather frighteningly that of all the people 
um, that had graduated, only one person had managed to get a job in law, and this, she was taking this as a way of trying to get in to get the work. But hand in hand with that is now the suggestion that you shouldn't be uh, taking people on to work for nothing. We were paying the secretary, I hasten to add, but people who actually apply for work experience more than just a week, but for a longer period, because actually that's the only way you're going to get a job. You won't get one otherwise, and it's not just going to be in law, it's going to be in other things as well. If you can get that experience and you can work hard, you can show that you are, you are, you've got what it takes, you're better than other people. And also, there's always a chance that in the place that you are there, because they know you, people, you know, if you've got ten people who are all the same, same qualifications, you're going to go for the one you know, aren't you? Super. Uh, we're a little bit over time, but I think just quickly we can get in one of those last and finally questions, which will... Perhaps get some surprise answers. You never know. Uh, and it's from Russell Simmons. If Russell could. Uh... Well, here we go with the most in-depth question of the night. Where is he? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Here we go with the most in-depth yeah. question of the night. If you could be reincarnated as anyone, who would you be? <laughs> Chris Hume. I'm thinking Formula One. I, I, I <laughs> said, since everything I seem to do at the moment involves lawyers in one form or another, uh, I think it would have to, I'd have to come back as a lawyer, because uh, it seems to me whatever you do, uh, it, the lawyers come out on top. Uh, oh, and, is that and... a prediction? That's absolutely untrue. I've never heard such nonsense in my life. Uh, Caroline, so if you were reincarnated... Well, I think I'm going to come back as an MP, because they clearly... <laughs> What more can okay, I say? Okay, indeed. Laurie. <laughs> oh. Do you well, want a second to think about it? I'm think, sure John's worked it out already. No, I think I'd come back as my Uncle Wilfie. Um, <laughs> he was a lead violinist in an orchestra called the George Melacrino Orchestra. He used to go on cruise liners from Southampton docks, and he always missed the boat back because he got off with some lady on the boat going over. <laughs> and it was usually a millionaire. Uh, uh, and... Uh, he had the best life of all, and he lived till he was 97. And uh, he looked like Errol Flynn. So, uh, yeah, he was the first one that came to mind, actually. Yeah. <laughs> okay. John Denham. Uh, I think I'd just, just... Anybody who was good enough to play cricket for England. Because oh, I would so. have loved to have played cricket at that sort of level. So anybody who was good enough, even just because he had one, day, one game and a one-day international, that would do for me. <laughs> <laughs> Julie Greer. It's a very difficult question. My mum is quite convinced she's reincarnated, but it's always somebody <laughs> famous, isn't it? It's rather bizarre. Um, I think, just where at the moment, to be something like a suffragette, where you're absolutely at the heart of something that really crucially changed everything, but actually you yourself were not majorly big, but just part of something huge. It must have been amazing. And George um, I have a very good friend in Florida. who My wife's from Florida, so we go out there quite often. He's called Bob Branham. He runs a boat out there and goes fishing from it. And he's done that for about 45 years, taking clients out. He's the happiest man I know. He's simply gently happy. He's not wealthy. He's not rich. He's not ambitious. He's just happy, and I'd like to be him. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming, and thank you to our panellists.